All right, so in the last video, we talked about a single slit. The pattern we looked at, the slit itself was vertical. That resulted in a pattern that we saw that had a wide, bright central maximum with smaller, not quite as bright maxima on either side. A circular aperture means essentially just a little circular hole that the light's gonna shine through. So our laser light coming, shining through the hole, we're going to see a pattern on the screen. So single slit, we had the laser light shining on this slit and the pattern we saw, single slit interference pattern. Inter pattern. Okay, so the video clip I was showing you We saw these slits, the patterns, what, what happened to the pattern when the slit was decreased. He is also going to show us a circular aperture. So let's watch that, that clip. Also do the same with circular. Now, by the way, really fast, as he was flipping the dial, he was changing that through. Sorry, let me get this toy. <laughs> He was flipping back through those single slits. So just watch that really quick again. Is This is where he got to the widest slit, but he has to flip back through them to get to the circular aperture. So I'm just rewinding it to watch that part again. We can also do the same with circular apertures. So this is a circular, instead of being a slit through which the laser beam is pointed, this is a circular aperture. The laser beam is incident on a hole and, and blocked from passing outside the hole and only goes through that hole. And what you see here is a pattern with a central bright spot in the middle, but then rings around it that are reminiscent of the uh, dots that appeared in the, in the single slit pattern. This is a very important pattern. The, the we're gonna talk about the importance in a little bit. I will explain the same thing he mentions. I wanna come back though to the simulation. So on this diffraction option on the simulation, I chose the square for the opening. If it is the same size, such that that opening is a perfect square, we see the diffraction go both right and left horizontally, but up and down vertically. As we increase the height of this square, the diffraction up and down vertically is still there, but it's different than the diffraction horizontally. The diffraction vertically is not spread out very far because essentially the vertical height or width of the slit vertically is large, and that makes the pattern really small. Here though, the width is still small, and that's why we see horizontally the pattern that looks like the single slit interference, because that's essentially what we're looking at. If I change to the circular opening, we see that bullseye pattern that he was mentioning, that he showed us. So the bullseye pattern here is unique to the circular aperture meaning essentially a pinhole, a tiny circle that the light is shining through. The pattern we see looks like a bullseye pattern. That central maximum, the dot, that circle in the middle is, has a larger radius and brightness, a bigger brightness than the other rings. We do see the rings around it. Similar to the single slit interference, if we change this diameter, of the opening, the pattern on the screen changes. The smaller the diameter of the actual opening, the aperture, the larger the diffraction becomes. 
If we make it a little bigger, that diffraction pattern, the radius of that central max gets smaller. So if we go back to our equations here, in terms of single slit, we found that y sub p is equal to p lambda l over a. p was our multiplier, 1, 2, 3, so forth. p1 gave us y1, the distance from the center of the central max to the first dark spot on either side. That y1 changes if we change the wavelength of the light, it would change if we change the distance between the slits and the screen, it changes if we change the width of the slit. As A got smaller, we saw the pattern get bigger, and vice versa. With the circular aperture, The pattern we see is a central maximum that is a circle. So a central bright spot again. The central max is still a bright spot. It is bright and it is bigger than any of the other maxima. This bright spot is surrounded by rings of light. They were thin rings of light. And we saw multiple rings. How many we saw depends upon the size or diameter of that opening. Okay. We end up so if you remember for single slit, we ended up with the angle between the reference line and the light ray go, or not, let me rephrase that, sorry. We ended up with theta sub p being p lambda a. What we meant by that angle is if we drew a reference line that was straight from the middle of the slit straight to the screen. That was our L. And a reference line that started in the same location but went up to the dark spot. The theta is right here. It is extremely small, which is why we can write it as theta as opposed to sine of theta. Keep in mind though, this angle has to be in radians. With similar measurements using the circular aperture, we find that theta, I'm looking to see if our, oh, no, ends up being approximately 1.22 lambda over d. This is a theta one. What we mean by that is if I go back to the picture over here on the left that I drew for the single slit, if I imagine this just to be the diameter of the circular opening, the theta one would be when this is the first dark spot. The middle is still a y equals zero. Whether we measure that up or down or side to side, so if I draw y equals zero vertical, then y1 I would measure horizontally over to here. So that distance from here to this first dark spot would be r1. But, I can totally draw my reference line this way, y equals zero. If I do that, then I'm measuring perpendicular to that line to the first dark spot, and that's gonna be my y1. So essentially, it's just a radius. 
with when the opening is a perfect circle, the pattern is a perfect circle as well. The 1.22 comes from a derivation that's beyond what we're going to be talking about. The 1.22, though, is required when we're talking about this circular opening or aperture. Similarly to the single slit, though, we can relate this to a Y1 over L. Coming back to this picture on the left side, Y1 was the distance from the center up to the dark spot, or whatever direction we drew to the dark spot. L is the distance to the screen. Because these angles are so small, we could relate that lambda over A to Y1 over L when P was 1. I can make that same relationship here. This picture applies to the circular opening. If we just talk about that slit portion as the diameter of the circular opening. So that's what the D in here represents, is the diameter of that circular aperture. The hole the light is shining through. If you have a nice camera, or even just your phone camera might tell you something about your aperture. Light coming through the camera, the aperture of the camera is going to produce a picture. We look through apertures all the time, our pupil. So examples of these, our pupil. Just looking through our eyeballs, the light enters through our pupil. The diameter of our pupil changes based off of how much light is in the room. When it's darker, our pupils tend to be bigger. If we are in a brighter room or outside when it's bright, our pupils get smaller, controlling how much light is actually passing into our eye. Camera is another example. The light is gonna pass through a circular opening. They call it a circular aperture. A telescope. Light has to pass through a circular opening. So this circular aperture is actually with us every day. We just don't necessarily think about it that much. As far as the equation is concerned, we can take this and say that y1 will be 1.22 lambda L over D. Where that first dark spot is located from the center of the pattern depends upon the wavelength of light, how far away the circular aperture is from the screen, and then diameter of the opening. If we want the width of the central max, which is often what we will want, similar to the single slit, that will just be double Y1. So 2.44 lambda L over D. Now in terms of the video, he started mentioning the importance, which we're going to talk about more in chapter 35 as well. It's a concept called resolution. Have you ever seen those paintings that are dots of color? But if you're standing far enough away, so a painting using dots of color, not, not smooth brush strokes. If you're standing far enough away though, looking at it, so if your distance is big enough, you see smooth pictures. You don't see that there's dots. It just looks like a normal painting to you. If you move closer to the painting, and you see 
the dots. We say that you can resolve those dots of color. This is the concept called resolution. Being able to resolve these dots of colors that you can actually see, they're individual dots, is how these patterns, so each dot of color is creating a little circular aperture pattern on your retina. That's your screen, that's the back of your eyeball. If all we do is see a smooth picture, those central maximas overlap. Central maximas overlap. If we are able to see the dots and thus resolve the color, the dots don't overlap. And they can still, the pattern, the central maxes don't overlap. Same idea if you've ever been driving down a road, it's nighttime, it's a long straight road, it's boring, and you're looking at oncoming traffic and you wonder, oh, is that a motorcycle or is it a car? And I don't know, it's too far away. Same idea. If you cannot tell yet, if you don't know if it's a motorcycle or a car, because it's too far away, that means you're getting central maxima from that light coming into your eye that's overlapping. As you get closer, it will get to the point where those do not overlap, and it's like, oh, yeah, that's a car. I can see both headlights now. Or it's close enough that you can see there is no other headlights. So that's a concept called resolution. We're going to talk about that more in Chapter 35. It does directly relate to this concept of the circular aperture pattern. So we'll talk double slits next and then diffraction gratings.